Hello, hello. Okay, yeah, so this is off the coast of Portugal where some of the largest waves have found, especially when there's offshore storms, they, they, uh, they push the water up uh, on the west coast of Europe. And right off the coast of Portugal, it gets, uh, it gets shallow very quickly. So you get these monstrous waves. This one's probably 80 or 90 feet. So a lot of those extreme surf guys go out to those areas and surf, uh, and surf that kind of conditions. That would be an incredible wave to see in a boat. I don't know if I would have the components to get on a surfboard on it, to be honest with you. And I consider I can't surf for crap. I, mean, I don't even know if I get on that with an air mattress. It'd be a hell of a ride, though, if I didn't know how to surf. That would, that would be pretty incredible. Just imagine the force. That wave breaks. That's a big problem. It's being underneath the wave when it breaks on top of you. Water weighs about eight pounds a gallon. All right, so just imagine how many gallons there are in this wave face as it breaks on top of you. Multiply that by eight. And that's about the force that's uh, compounding down on you when you when that wave does break over top of you. So today's topic, of course, is going to be about waves. First thing I want to talk about is how waves are generated. And you guys will probably already know this because we've talked about wind in the past, about the circulation of ocean currents and about the circulation of the air currents and how those are all tied together. And absolutely, it's the wind for the most part that causes the wave, the wind blowing across the surface of the water. Uh, it, it's friction that's involved there. Uh, wind doesn't have a lot of force. Would we say something like 2% uh, of the energy from the wind actually gets transmitted into the waves? And that's because the water is so much more viscous. It's thicker, or denser than the air. So you've got something that's a lot less dense trying to push something that's much more dense. Uh, and so you don't get a lot of the transmission of the energy from the water actually into the wave itself. Uh, so the wave is propagating to the right in the picture up above. And the wind blowing across the waves, if we've got an air-ocean interface, we get these ocean waves. And we also have these internal waves that occur down at depth. Uh, Jeffrey's sheltering model of wave generation, what that's trying to show you is the physics of what causes a wave to move in this direction in, in the area of propagation. So again, this is the wind blowing over the top. And what the Jeffrey's sheltering model says is the pressure on the wave from the wind is, is greatest on the back side of the wave, where the wind is hitting it, obviously. And the pressure is least on the leeward side of the wave, where the wave is on the uh, other side of the part that Wind. So what you're going to get here is positive and negative air pressure, or not, positive and neg negative pressure differentials. And things always move from a positive pressure to a negative pressure. So it's kind of like I gave you the example last week when looking at the sailboats, right? I said sailboats don't really get pushed by the wind. They just basically fall into the vacuum that's in front of them. Same thing's happening here. This negative indicates a lower pressure, higher pressure, lower pressure, where it's just like uh, weather. So that wave is going to want to fall into that negative pressure. That's going to cause that wave to move along and propagate. The ones that are found uh, deep in the ocean, the internal waves, that's a little different. They can be massive. They can be, in some cases, hundreds of feet high. Uh, oftentimes, these internal waves are caused by differences in density. Uh, the pinocline, which is that change in density in water. Remember, there's a thermocline where the temperature changes. The pinocline is the, de is the density. Uh, now, in internal waves uh, are, are caused by interactions between the low-density water and the high-density water. And since the water is much more viscous, there's a lot more of the energy in the low-density water that's put into causing these waves. It's not like the problem here with air blowing across water. We have liquid moving other forms of liquid. And again, that's, in, uh, that's uh, uh, that increased density causes increased friction and causes more effect to occur. Uh, internal waves are, are important for global climate because of the fact that these internal waves oftentimes are what brings around the different uh, heat uh, or the cooling or the nutrients that we talked about as it spreads throughout the ocean. It's an interesting thing uh, that your book talks about that submarines have to be very careful get, getting caught in these internal waves because a submarine in an internal wave can actually be dropped down to a depth beyond its crush depth. Uh, which in the new submarines is somewhere around 1,000 meters. I would imagine that's probably not the accurate number. I'm sure there's some secret number out there about what depth our submarines crush at, or submarines in general. I think of all the ways to go, that would be one of the worst, going down the submarine. When you get down to crush depth, what basically happens is the seams of the submarine start coming apart, and the water that shoots in through the little cracks has got the force behind like a jet, like jet power. 
and it actually cut people in half because of the pressure that it's under you know, from, from the water around it. All right, so we've got the low density water being pushed by the air from the surface waves and then internal waves, which are caused by the differences between the density of water pushing each other. All right, now, what is a wave? Well, a wave basically is an oscillation back and forth, right? And we can talk about waves that are progressive waves, waves that move in a, in, in a uniform fashion uh, without breaking. Waves can be of longitudinal type push and pull. And that's what they're showing you. With the clapping of your hands. When you clap your hands and you send out sound waves, what you're doing is you're actually causing a mixture <coughs> excuse me, of a compressive force and a release of that compressive force. It works like a spring. Uh, transverse waves is like if you took a string and you waved it up and down, that would be a transverse wave. The particles move up and down, and the energy moves in perpendicular to the way that the waves are moving up and down. Uh, transverse waves you generally only find in solids, but they do occur in water, but they usually occur in a combination of longitudinal and transverse waves. So when we take the, the, the sound waves, the wave of taking a rope and wiggling it up and down to combine those two together, we get the air ocean waves, a mixture of that longitudinal force as well as that transverse force moving up and down and also moving across. The wave lingo here. The wave base right down here, the wave base is the depth at which the wave on the surface has little effect to the, to the water down below. As you can see, as we're moving down through the water depth, the amount of force, these little circles are getting smaller and smaller. So down here at the wave base, the part in green, there's negligible water movement. Think about the wave, uh, wave base as kind of being kind of like the bedrock, right? Being kind of a solid part of the terrestrial environment that isn't affected by all the stuff moving up above it. Uh, the wave base is proportional to wavelength, so that longer wavelengths have a deeper wave base, and deeper waves also move faster. I don't know how well you can see this, but what this is saying is the depth of the wave to the wave base, so the depth from the height of the wave to the wave base is half the wavelength. So this is one way. A wavelength is the distance between successive peaks or successive troughs, and when the, this is, so this is one wavelength. When the distance between the top of the wave and a half of that wavelength, that distance down from the, from the surface, is where we get the wave base. And this is like I said, negligible water movement. So a wave that has a wavelength of 100 feet would only penetrate down to about 50 feet in, in beneath the water. Now, if you've ever been scuba diving and you got seasick on the surface, you know that when you got into the water, especially when you uh, if you drop down below the surface of the water, your, your, your motion sickness went away pretty quick. And the reason being is because once you drop down below the water, you're not nearly the effect of the waves that you do when you're standing on the the surface. You all ever been seasick? Oh my God, it's the worst feeling in the world. I joined the Navy and the first time we went out to sea, I was sick for the entire time and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? I did get kind of used to it. Uh, I would occasionally get sick a little bit depending on the weather, but uh, uh, it was that first uh, couple times I went to sea, I thought, man, I, you can't escape it. You can't get away from it. There's nothing you can take for it. There's nothing you can do. It's just a miserable feeling. You know, constantly, constantly just feel like you get sick. A lot of old guys I knew in the Navy that had spent 20 years and then they still got seasick. You'd be standing outside talking to them and they would be, say something and I would and they throw up over the side, wipe their mouths off, and keep going. It's just like sneezing. <laughs> That's kind of weird. All right, now when do waves break? Well, waves break when the height of the wave reaches a seventh of the length. Okay, so this is physics that's being involved here. So when the height of the wave is a seventh of the length of the wave, the wave is going to break. I wrote it down here below in opposite. It said, so when the wavelength is seven times the wave height. That's when the wave breaks. All right, and once again, wavelength between crests or troughs, uh, and down here, of course, is what, what we call the still water level. This is that hypothetical level of the water. All right, now we're going to 
So what basically happens because of that transverse and that longitudinal movement is things move in a circle. All right, so they move in a circle. The circ circular plus the longitudinal uh, of the circular is the longitudinal transverse. Things move in a circle. Wave particles move in a circle. That duck in the picture moves in a circle, but the wave moves forward. Things don't move along on the top of the wave. They stay in the same place. So this little ducky here is going to ride up this part of the wave, and it gets to the top. It's going to turn and fall back the back side of the wave. But that duck is going to stay basically in the same place the whole time. It's the wave form, which is the energy of the wave that's moving. Now, there is a little bit of something called wave drift. And wave drift basically says that the little duck or the particle or the object that's in the water actually just moved forward a little tiny bit. And the reason why that is is because of the speed of the particles in the trough right here is actually less than the speed of the particles in the crest. So if you think about this, it is definitely moving forward and backwards, forward and backwards. But because the speed up here at the crest is greater than the trough, he moves forward a little bit further, and then he moves backwards. So it's like two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. But it's only in a little bit. That's a little bit of the wave drift. The rest of the time, or for the most part, it just looks like it's staying in the same place. So the wave doesn't move, but the energy moves. And the energy, of course, is what hits shore. And if we think about some of the storm surges and some of the problems, that's where that energy comes from that causes the destruction of the sea. You know there's a lot of force in a wave. If you've ever been out to the beach, which I know you live in Florida, you have. You felt getting hit by a wave. And those are relatively small waves. Right, ground swells that we call them. You can imagine, you know, the large wave the force that they have behind it. So that's the force that's moving these objects in a circular fashion. And what you're feeling when the wave hits you, that's the energy that that wave is putting forth. So it's only the energy that moves forward. Particles stay in the same place. So that little rubber duck would flip there forever for the most part. All right, and as I said, it's the wind that generally is going to cause the waves. So first we have what we call capillary waves, and capillary waves are small little ripples. Uh, but as those ripples get larger and larger and larger, then more wind can push you get them. There's more force behind it. So a, a, a capillary waves eventually become coil or gravity waves. And gravity waves are the waves that break when the crests become pointed. So as we're moving along we have capillary waves the wind's blowing get a little bit bigger notice the wavelength is, is, is lengthening out this is only 1.75 centimeters of the capillary wave, 10 meters for a wavelength when you're gravity wave and then as that moves along as that continues to move along once the steepness the height is one seventh of the length then it's going to break so the height of the wave more than, uh, more than one seventh the length of the wave, the wave breaks. Physics. What kind of cool when you think about it? You can calculate it with numbers. Of course, out in the sea, different things cause waves. For example, a storm front moving from east to west is going to cause a bunch of swells to form out in front of it. The wave speed in this case is going to be determined by the speed of the wind, the fetch. We all remember what fetch was from last week. The fetch is the disc over which the water blows, right? So a, a big lake, water or, 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 or wind blow, excuse me. The wind blowing over a big lake would have a longer fetch. And the longer the fetch, the bigger the waves. The wind blows longer. Of course, it's also determined by, uh, by duration. Uh, fully developed seas is when the energy from the waves it receives from the wind is equal to the energy lost when breaking. Now, gosh, that's out of focus, but I am not just talk to you about this. Look, the wind speed is about what, 12 miles an hour, 20 kilometers. The average height of a wave is about three-tenths of a meter or about a foot. And those waves are going to, like I said, they're going... Those waves are going to, going to break when the energy from the wind equals the energy lost when breaking. So the average wave height is about a foot at 20 miles an hour, and that's when the waves are going to start breaking at that point. That's when the energy of the force of the wave received from the wind is lost when it's breaking. Look at some of these waves. Wind speed in, when Charlie came through, we had winds up to 90 miles an hour. That could kick up waves in the vicinity of about 45 feet. 
That's a big wave. 45. And I think the biggest wave I ever saw was probably close to 40 feet. That was a pretty doggone good size wave as well. I like this though. Check this out. The wind blows 90 miles an hour. Average wave is 45 feet tall. The top 10% of waves when the wind is blowing that fast can approach somewhere in the city with 94 feet. That's the top 10%. Now, for so many years, and we'll talk about that in just a second, we thought this whole idea of big waves was sort of a, 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 a sea story. You know, the sailors would go out and, and talk about these magnificent organisms they saw, and mermaids, and, and kraken, and all that sort of stuff. Why do you think they did that, by the way? I think the purpose of all that was. Make themselves seem like Sure, it makes themselves feel like there were really tough people going out there fighting all these vicious things that were found out there in the ocean. You know the difference between a sea story and a fairy tale, right? Fairy tales start once upon a time. Sea stories start, start this is no shit. Right? Same thing. Okay. So look at some of these waves. You think about it, 95 feet. Can you imagine a 95 foot wave? How tall that is? That's a 90 story building. It's amazing to imagine the kind of force that occurs. Now the highest documented wave in 1933 was one that was close to 112 feet. The reason why that's significant is that we thought, physicists had told us up to that point, that it was physically impossible to have a wave larger than 60 feet. They said you could not make a wave taller than 60 feet because of the physics, the weight of the water. Come to find out, that was definitely not a fact. That 60 foot rule that we adopted for the longest period of time was not the case. So when sailors were coming back and telling us about these huge waves they saw, we were arguing, saying, no, there's no way because it's physically impossible to make a wave that tall. 60 foot is definitely not a rule. There are waves out there that are significantly higher. Now, I'm not talking about tsunami waves, folks. I'm talking about these normally produced waves that are caused by the wind moving over the surface. Tsunamis, as you know, those waves are caused by totally different circumstances. Oh, beautiful shot, right? Nice swell, very calm. It's nice sailing, very beautiful, right? Fantastic conditions. Now, swells can actually cause waves to get larger. If two swells come together and they're both in phase with one another, they add. It's called constructive interference. So this wave and this wave are both in line with one another. So they're both peaking at the same place. They both have the same troughs in the same place. That's constructive. On the other hand, if, the, if they're out of phase, if the crest of one is found in the same place where the trough of another wave and they meet, what they do is they cancel each other out and get calm seas. That flat seas. That's destructive interference. You've seen constructive interference before sometimes at the beach, right? You see waves coming in and all of a sudden there's a bigger wave. And if you notice, it's because waves are gathering together and they're forcing that wave up. So constructive interference, you're going to get bigger waves. Destructive interference, you're going to get smaller waves. And in a mixed interference, you're going to get a mixed pattern of swells. Now, swells are just miniature waves. Again, they're like those capillary waves that we're talking about. The wind's blowing over the surface and just causing these swells. But as you, uh, as those swells get blown over longer and longer fetches, longer and longer distances, they get taller and taller. Now they can travel, like I said, for very long distances. Waves are amazing. They can travel around the world. It's incredible to think about them being able to do that. Now look at some of the global wave heights. The highest wave heights that we usually find on Earth are down here around the Southern Ocean. Uh, middle of the Pacific, a little bit off the east coast of Florida. You get some areas with relatively high waves, waves in the order of about three meters. That's nine foot. That's a pretty good size wave. Why do you think there's so much high wave? Why there's so many high waves down here on the Southern Ocean? What do we know about the conditions down around there? You get real nice and calm conditions, very little wind. No storms, or we say the opposite. All of those air masses coming together. Think about too, like off the southern tip of South America and Africa. Many times we have we have currents coming together, going against each other. Those are going to contribute to some monstrous waves. The average wave height down around Antarctica, somewhere in the vicinity of six meters. Six meters. You know, if you go out on the little cruise ship up here, on the way to the Bahamas, the biggest wave you'll probably ever hit is maybe a two or three footer, unless you get stuck in a storm. When you think about some of the size of these waves, it's just amazing. 
I know there were some times when I was in the, we were off in the western part of the Pacific Ocean, my ship would come up out of the water. And my ship was 500 feet long, so it was a good sized ship. So my ship would come up out of the water. And, and again, I don't draw so well. But as it made its way up to the top of the wave, what it would do is it actually would come out of the water, right? Not the whole thing, the big ship. And then it would fall down into the trough. So the ship would actually surf off the top of the wave and fall down into the trough between. And this fall, this was when I was in those 40 foot waves, this fall would be 30, 40 feet. And when the, when the ship would hit the bottom, it would make this weird noise. It was like a dog shaking water off its back. And you could hear it from the front of the ship. The ship would start shaking. You could hear it coming and it would shake all the way to the back of the ship. All the way through. You, wherever you were in the ship, you could hear it coming. And when it came by, everything was flying all over the place. You had to like duck your head. All the books were coming off the shelf. And then it would move down to the back of the ship. And we did that for an entire day. Oh, falling into the truck. Up, falling into the trough. So basically nothing more than just kind of holding on. And that's what we just kind of tie ourselves to everything. Nobody, in those kinds of conditions, nobody ever gets seasick. You're not thinking about it. Right, seasickness is the furthest thing from your mind. I'm thinking about, holy shit, we can break apart out here in the middle of the ocean. It's my butt. Even had guys going around checking the wells in the ship to make sure that they weren't breaking. Oh my goodness, all right? So, Waves have enough force that can easily cause a lot of destruction. It's a lot of weight behind water. Now, the Beaufort scale, the Beaufort scale is a wind scale that was put together by, uh, uh, I, I don't think you can memorize the Beaufort scale by any stretch of your imagination, folks, but the Beaufort scale runs between 0 and 12. And again, this was a wind scale put together by, originally by, uh, by, uh, by sailors, by folks going out to sea. And as the numbers increase, we have more wind, uh, of course, with wind, we get storm surge, and that's another big problem. With the wind blows on shore, it pushes the water up on shore, and that causes storm surge. That causes water to, you know, penetrate back further inland. I like this one down here. Uh, when you get to force 12, Let's see if I can read that a little bit better. All right, at force 12, we're running at about 72 miles an hour of wind, up to 113. Countryside. <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It totally wipes out the countryside. And that's just some of the forces that you're involved in. And the damage, I got some pictures of some ships that have been damaged by waves. See this right here? There's the bow. Look at that big chunk. And then blast it out, by the way. Front of the ships oftentimes take damage. This is an aircraft carrier from World War II. Look at the deck. That's a steel deck. And you can see where the wave hit it and just kind of bent it, uh, bent it down. Now, this is what it might look like when you're encountering a wave like that. Here's the bow of the ship, and you're looking out at a wave that is clearly, clearly you know, 30, 40, 50 feet tall. Amazing if you took something like that. Now, many years ago, they had these things called rogue waves, R O G U E. We didn't think they existed. We thought that they, if they did, they were very rare. Rogue waves are something that sailors would talk about, monster waves that would find out in the middle of the ocean. And so we figured a lot of that was sea story. But as time has gone on, we found out that there are, on a regular basis, these massive waves that show up on the surface of the earth. It's just that the uh, world is a really big place, and it's easy not to see one of these. So this is an artist's depiction of a rogue wave, but still I can't imagine you're zipping along in your little sailboat, and there's the waves in the background, man. That's a big wave. Rogue waves are massive, spontaneous. They seem to come out of nowhere. Folks on ships that have been hit by rogue waves will talk about being in heavy seas and, you know, 40... 30 foot seas, and all of a sudden here comes a 90 foot wave out of the middle of nowhere. And as I said, for the longest time, we felt that that was probably just a bunch of baloney. Uh, they get to these abnormal heights with a lot of power, not as rare as we initially thought. In 2001, they did a satellite study and they found, uh, uh, what's that number? Over 25 meters in height, 10 waves in three weeks that were over 25 meters in height. 
three weeks by scanning the ocean, they were able to find 10 75 foot waves. At least they think those things were really, really rare. Response, they come out of nowhere, they're hard to forecast. Causes can be things like constructive interference, weather fronts, uh, strong ocean currents that oppose each other. Here we are down the southern coast of South Africa again. So this is the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean, and the two currents meet and come into one, run into one another. So along comes a ship that's moving along this current, right? And then here comes the Antarctic storm wave front, and they push together, and they cause this rogue wave to form. And a ship doesn't have to be completely swamped, just the front part of the ship, enough to actually fill the holes, and the ship goes down. So let's talk about we have triangle, people get lost at sea, never hearing from them again. This is probably what's happened to most of those folks. Something like this happens, you have no, you have no evidence of it. There's no debris left behind. These people sink and nobody ever hears from them again. There's probably been thousands of shipwrecks that have gone through that. And now that we know that rogue waves are a little bit more common than we thought. All right, now as they approach the shore, we get into the surf zone. This is when the deep water encounters the encounters the shoal. Uh, and when the waves are less than half of their wavelength, they become what we call transitional waves. So these are the depth is half of the wavelength. We reach that point, it's called the transitional wave. As the wave touches bottom, what happens is the wave speed decreases, the wavelength uh, uh, also decreases, the wave height increases, and then when we reach that one seventh, the wave then breaks. All right, so we're moving ashore. The waves are getting closer together. The wavelength is decreasing, but the height is getting taller, and then eventually it falls over when it reaches that one to seven ratio between the height and the length. All right. Three types of breakers, spilling, plunging, and surging. Spilling uh, breakers. Uh, what we saw, see here a lot more in Florida is the spilling breakers, the big waves that come up and then the wave just kind of slides down the face, the face of it. It's usually what we find with more gently sloping uh, seafloors. If it's a little bit more moderately steep, then we get the plunging wave with the curl and the tube that surfers love. Right? This is the plunging wave. Now, plunging waves can be particularly deadly because, of course, so once again, if you're in this part as the wave is plunging down on you, and then all that force of the wave. Uh, surging waves is when the uh, seafloor uh, slopes up very abruptly. The energy is spread over a short, a shortest distance, and the waves break onshore. These are good for body surfing. Uh, the uh, Canaveral National Seashore. All right, Canaveral National Seashore. This is the kind of wave you can see there. You're not going to get these surging waves. You're not going to get the spilling and plunging, or you're not going to get the spilling waves and the plunging waves. You're going to get the surging. Now, as waves uh, approach a beach, right, as they approach the shore, uh, rarely do they do that head on. In other words, rarely do they do that at a 90 degree angle. So here's the shore. Rarely do waves hit the shore like that. The waves are propagated. Usually they're not propagated to be like that. Or the shoreline's not like that. So as the waves approach the shore, what they do is they tend to bend towards the shore. And that's, that's actually a relationship between the water and the friction that's occurring on the corner of the wave that's closest to the shore. So if this wave is approaching at an angle, right, so it's coming in this way, this part of the wave is going to hit the shallow part first, and that's going to slow down, and that's going to cause the wave to curve to the left. So they refract. So they curve towards the shoreline. You can see in this picture what I'm talking about. All right, so here's the shoreline. Here comes the wave. This part of the wave hits the shallow part first, causes it to curve, and eventually it ends up, so it looks like it's coming parallel to the shore, but the wave didn't approach the shore uh, in a parallel fashion. It's only parallel when it actually reaches the shoreline and breaks. Um, this is where we get this whole idea of wave energy causing erosion and sedimentation. Orthogonal. Orthogonal lines are lines of, 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 of the same amount of energy. 
time say. So these indicate the same amount of energy. As we reach an area called a, a break, this is a break right here, the wave energy is concentrated on the point of that break. That's where the name for the movie with Swayze and Keanu Reeves came from, point of break, all about surfing. Surfing in these areas where you find these kinds of conditions. So the wave energy is concentrated, you're going to get erosion at the, at the tip of the point, and you're going to get sedimentation and beaches forming uh, on either side of the point. You can see in this picture here, the wave is driving from this angle, and here's the point, and notice how the wave turns and makes that corner run. So the shoreline and the waves definitely interact with each other, depending on you know what kind of waves we got and what kind of shoreline you're hitting. Ah. Oh. Of all the natural phenomena out there, I have to think that tsunamis is one of the most overwhelming just to imagine what goes on in the tsunami. Now, first of all, let's not call them tidal waves. Tidal waves are actually, uh, or tidal waves are called by tides. And there actually are some areas in which you get a pretty good sized tide as it comes in or uh, into the shore. But these aren't tidal waves, they're caused by things like earthquakes or underwater landslides. East coast of Florida is in the crosshairs of a potential underwater landslide tsunami. The uh, western coast of the Canary Islands, I don't remember the name of the mountain, there's a mountain in the Canaries of the Azores, but it's just barely sitting there, volcanic. And if all of that material were to slip into water all at once, that would cause this massive wave and could potentially cause a tsunami that we would feel on the other side of the ocean could potentially flood Miami or a good portion of Miami. Luckily, we don't expect that landslide to happen anytime soon, but we don't know exactly when it will happen. Uh, we all know, of course, now after the incident in the Indian Ocean, what to, what to do. If, the, if you're standing on the beach and the water recedes way out, get the hell out of there, right? It means that there's something coming ashore. Volcanic collapse or volcanic eruptions a meteorite impact, splash waves, that's when the dinosaurs went extinct. That's one of the things that wiped out a lot of the life on the planet was this huge meteorite that hit the you know, asteroid. How big was that asteroid that killed the dinosaurs again? Uh, big, what? Big New York City. It was the size of Manhattan. It was a rock the size of the man of Manhattan. Now, you know that, that uh, Arizona meteor crater? You ever seen a picture of the meteor crater out in Arizona? I'm going to do a little comparison here so you guys can get an idea of your crater. There it is. It's out in Arizona. Now, years ago, when this hit the ground, back in the 19th century, there were some uh, business folks one of precious metals and meteors and stuff like that, meteorites. So they thought, well, they would dig this up and base on the side hole. Now, this uh, this hit Earth somewhere around 50,000 years ago, so long before humans were around. Uh, but they thought, oh, my goodness, that must be a big old chunk of this precious metal. We should be able to dig it up uh, and, and make a lot of money off of it. So in, in the meteor crater now, left over from that day, there are some drilling operations down at the very bottom. When they finally found the meteorite that caused this big hole, it was about that big around. The amount of energy involved is what causes such a big hole that you see there. It doesn't have to be a big object. Now, translate that what I just said about the one that killed all the dinosaurs. That was inside of Manhattan, that rock. So that absolutely had devastating effects on it. It peeled away the surface of the Earth. It caused these huge tsunami splash waves to spread out. And of course, wiped out all the dinosaurs a good chunk of some of the other existing organisms a lot of plants and animals uh, went extinct during that time so that would have been quite the uh, quite the event um they have very excuse me very long wavelengths can be on the order of 125 miles that's why you don't notice them when you're out at sea that's why uh tsunamis out at sea if you're out fishing away from the coast uh you might See, just a little swell go by. It doesn't even, it doesn't even, it's not even detectable. You don't even notice it. But very long wavelengths, and when it gets close to shore, of course, what happens? Wavelength decreases. You do the math right. Long wavelength, short height. Short wavelength, 
tall height. They're related to one another. So as those wavelengths, which is 125 miles long, as it's making its way onto shore and it's getting to it's getting into shallower and shallower water, by the way, they can move very fast too. In some orders close to four to five hundred miles an hour, these waves can move. So as these waves are hitting the shore, the wavelength is decreasing, the wave height is increasing, and when it reaches one over seven, then you're gonna get that bridge. Right? You're gonna get that huge tsunami break. Now the largest documented tsunami in the world. In 1971, it was 85 meters, 280 feet. I just can't imagine a wave that big. You know, that's just unfathomable. You'd be out there standing on the coast and look at something like that. Of course, I guess if you're looking out on the coast, you'd be one of the last ones to draw. Can't outrun these waves. as those people in, in India or in um, all the parts of the Indian Ocean. This is the 2000 and, uh, it's four, wasn't it? Christmas 2004, when exactly, yeah. The sea level rose up to 40 meters. And notice once again, people think, oh, tsunamis, you'll have a big breaking wave. It, it didn't happen that way here. This was just a big surge of water. So it's sort of like a storm surge in a way. And the sea level rose 40 meters, moving at about nine miles an hour. So all of these folks standing right here, unless there's a few Hussein Bolts in that group, they didn't make it out of that water before it got ashore. You cannot outrun a tsunami. Again, it always amazes me of the number of people, because right before the tsunami hit, the wave recedes back, and it, it basically this whole area that was underwater was, was, was out of water, it was, uh, was dry. People walking around there collecting fish. I thought it was interesting to look at, you know. I was like, holy cow, folks. You gotta know what that means. You're sitting out on the beach one day, so think about that next time you're in New Smyrna, and you're looking out and the, and the waves recede at way out past the breakers, head in shore, right? Either that or learn how to run faster than nine miles an hour. I go hot, I go up. I just want to find something to climb up. Oh, there was some talk I remember back then about elephants being able to sense the tsunami was coming. So you guys hear all that? That's it. There's no way elephants could sense the tsunami. The reason why they say that is the elephants in this area went, uh, after the earthquake, moved to higher ground. So if it's not the elephants must have known about the tsunami. Now, I grant you, elephants are pretty smart critters. I'm not saying anywhere from elephants. But I find it hard to believe as many times as they would have encountered a tsunami like they would have associated it together. But they do know rumbling means earthquakes. And of course, earthquake means you need to get away from you know, areas that would be potentially dangerous. So they would run off into the woods and get higher ground. I don't remember when this happened. I'll get to the thing in just a second, and I want to something that makes. Yeah, 2004. Most of them are in the Pacific. Why do most large tsunamis occur in the Pacific? Where does most earthquake activity on Earth occur? Marine Pacific, right? That's right. So you have underwater, you have these big uh, 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 plates of rock, and they're shifting and moving, and that pushes water up, or causes a vacuum and draws the water down, and that propagates a wave. So you can see around that Pacific Ring of Fire, these numbers right here from out of your book are going to get some of the biggest waves. And the one in here it is uh, December 26, 2004, in Indonesia, the height of the wave was 115 feet, killed 300,000 people. Now that's 300,000 people. Uh, most of them, of course, in Thailand and then area in Phuket and the beaches there. But there were also some people uh, in, off the shore of India uh, and Africa that, uh, that, that felt this storm surge come, come ashore because these waves had spread out. 300,000 people. It always was interesting to me. I wonder if you had gone back in time and human civilization had, humans had just started evolving into humans. And let's say all of the humans on Earth lived around that Indian Ocean area during that time. So essentially, we could have wiped out the human species in one day. That's interesting in a way. Not interesting in a, not in a macabre sense, but just uh, reminds me how tenuous life is on the planet. We literally could have wiped out an entire species in one day. Some of the other ones, some of the bigger ones. 
102 feet. When the one you hit in Japan just recently, November in 2011, 131 feet. What was the problem with the one that hit in Japan, though? What was the real? <laughs> the nuclear oh, yeah. power plant that it flooded? Yeah, the nuclear power plant that flooded. The and all of the radiation that got leaked out from there. Uh, Magnitude 9.2 earthquake off of the coast of Sumatra. All right, so deadliest of tsunami history, 300,000 people. So off the coast of Sumatra, this is what the area of, this is Bonder Ak Aki, if I remember the name of the place there in Indonesia. This is what it looked like before. This is what it looked like after. And the wave just washed the shore, and then when it washed back, it brought all that stuff with it. And you can see it's just basically denuded the entire uh, area. There's a village. This is all the villages in there. Completely wiped out. 9.2. That's a pretty good size earthquake. Now, at about the time the earthquake or the tsunami was occurring, the Jason 1 satellite passed over just about two hours afterwards. This is the track of the satellite. And what you see in these yellow and red rings, it's kind of like uh, ripples if you threw a rock into a pond of water. These are the ripples of the tsunami spreading out through the Indian Ocean. So you notice in just two hours, the earthquake occurred right about here. In just two hours, the tsunami waves or the higher elevated waves had made their way to the coast of India. And eventually, this is one a little bit later on, a couple of days later on, these right here, those are echoes of the tsunami. So it had spread throughout the entire world. So we actually felt it here in Florida, just a slight increase in the water levels. So that's an, that, that's an amazing amount of force. The wavelength was somewhere in the vicinity of about 500 kilometers or 300 miles. And again, there are 300,000 people in 11 countries. There's no warning system. This is what I think is kind of cool. Our days on Earth got shorter because of that earthquake by about 2.676 microseconds. I'll show you why. All right. Everybody seen uh, ice skaters do this, right? Spin around. I bring my hands in. What happened? Put my hands out. I swim slow. Right? Same thing happened to Earth. When the Earth went through this earthquake, the Earth shifted into place and became slightly smaller, slightly smaller, just by fractions, okay? And that's and because the Earth is still spinning. That slightly smaller Earth caused the Earth to spin a little bit faster. It changed the rotational uh, periodicity of the Earth. It's amazing. Now, 2.676 microseconds, that's not much, right? It's less than a blink of an eye. But it still is amazing to think that things like that affect, you know, these, these, these tried and true things we know about the way the Earth uh, rotates around the sun, the way the Earth rotates on its axis. I love that kind of stuff. It's amazing to me. Thank you. All right, now there's no warning system in the Indian Ocean. That's why so many people were killed. There was reports when they went out looking at the damage. Uh, the Indonesian folks said that in a helicopter were checking some of the outlying islands. And they get ready to land on this one island that they think is deserted. All these arrows come up from everywhere. People are shooting at this helicopter. They finally land on the island, and they find that there's an indigenous tribe that lives on this island that nobody ever knew even existed. Uh, that uh, uh, you know, a lot of them got wiped out by the tsunami, but this was the first time they ever discovered those people. Isn't it great to discover folks nobody ever knew existed before, like out in the jungle somewhere? Maybe not for the people, right? Not for the yeah. people got discovered. But we kind of need to think there's areas on the planet when we we still don't know who's there. We do have a tsunami warning system in the uh, in the Pacific. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center in Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, uh, records all the earthquake seismic wave uh, activity. Now, seismic wave is the wave you get from the earthquake, and of course, the earthquake can potentially cause a tsunami. Not always. And the benefit is that seismic waves move a lot faster than tsunami waves. Seismic waves move on the order of about 15 times faster than a tsunami. So if you get the seismic wave and has the potential to cause a tsunami, then you have a lot of time to get that information out. Again, that, that wasn't available in the, in the Indian Ocean. I like this. In case of earthquake, go to high ground or in. That's pretty good advice. Okay. 
you can see this is some of the swirling there in Indonesia that just occurred. So this was at one time part of the village. It just swirled. It took most of all that. And then there's all kinds of this stuff. They're starting to find some of that stuff washing up on the west coast of the United States, too, that came from uh, the Fukushima accident over there as well. Now, we also have this thing called DART, which is the Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of a Tsunami. And that's a system of buoys, all right, that actually can sense the pressure of a tsunami passing overhead. So when the tsunami wave passes overhead, these buoys can detect that and can relay that signal back to, back to land so that we can give people warning to get out there. What makes you wonder, though, if there was a tsunami that was going to hit the west coast of California, and then you evacuate Los Angeles, San Diego, in all those areas and the amount of time it would take. Outrageous. All right. Isn't it true that like LA and all those places aren't prepared in for a tsunami like the way it was? Like the, the buildings. The buildings aren't like the way that Japan made them. Yeah. So they, you know, slightly moved during Well, a lot of the buildings, the newer buildings built in California are built with those earthquake survival techniques you know the, the buildings are basically built on sliding pads allow them to move back and forth but as far as the tsunamis go it's the storm surge and, okay. and while you know they could perhaps put up a barrier wall for a certain degree of storm surge you probably couldn't yeah. do that at all there's there's a, like the san onofre nuclear power plant which is right on the coast of california literally on the coast of being <laughs> part of the power plant so that could easily wash ashore and cause damages that way and and you know, protecting yourself against stuff like that. Think about the money involved in building a wall to protect yourself against a tsunami that might come once every 500 years. Yeah. So folks are going to say, well, we'll just take our chances and play the odds. We can also use the waves as a source of energy. There's a tremendous amount of energy. As a matter of fact, the amount of energy is equal to the height of the wave squared. It's the amount of force or energy. And again, that's what you feel when it pounds on you. So the height, the height of the wave squared. Uh, large storm waves are probably your best bet because they have a lot of height. Uh, but the protection of the power plant, how do you build something that deals with being pounded by the size of waves you need to make it profitable or make it reasonable to get energy from it? you got to build, like, here's an example of one. And what happens in this particular case is as the water moves in and out of this housing, the air moves in and out. So as it moves in, it pushes the air this way. And as the waves move back out, it pulls the air, and that causes this turbine this thing to spin. When it does, it's hooked up to a generator. But again, you're going to have to have sufficiently sized enough wave, and if that's the case, you have to build this sufficiently strong enough to deal with those waves. Not to mention, you have to have a ton of these along the shoreline, and that would cause a whole kind of marine habitat degradation. Most species in the ocean, I think we've talked about this before, live near the coast. They don't live out in the middle of the ocean. So building these kinds of things that would disrupt the, the, the current patterns, perhaps the nutrient availability, or ecosystems where, where different triggers live, uh, can cause tremendous damage to the ecosystem, and that could cause problems, of course. So every time we come up with these kinds of solutions for these things, you've got to keep in mind that it's kind of like we talked about with desalination, you know, with the reverse osmosis that Tampa is doing, drawing the taking salt water, drawing the water out leaving the salt behind, but then what do they do with the salt? Well, they come dump it back into Tampa Bay. And that unfortunately raises the salinity of Tampa Bay and affects the organisms in there as well. So these things don't come without a cost, and that's why they always have to be balanced. Now, as far as wave energy goes, it also depends on where you are. Uh, the higher or the, the redder the color, red, orange, and yellow, are the higher waves, and you tend to find most of those, again, near the Southern Ocean, where we started off just a few minutes ago talking about, you know, we're not going to get a lot of that around here, right? California, maybe a little bit up around the northern part of uh, Oregon, northern part of California, there might be sufficient enough wave uh, energy to be able to, start to, to create energy from that up here in the Bering Sea. Uh, but for the most part, good chunks of the world have very very little uh, average wave heights. So wave energy would be good, but it's only going to be good in certain places. It's kind of like a solar power. Taking solar power energy is good as long as you live in a place where you have sufficient enough uh, sun to have solar power. Or windmills. You know, build an area have sufficient enough wind to drive. All right, I think that's all. We're a little bit early today. That's all I have to discuss with you guys today. Do you guys have any questions for me? That's the last one. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Like the least 
out of all the renewable energy sources, the least, in, I want to say, invasive to species and stuff? Yes. It's just the yeah, it's solar energy. The only thing that solar energy causes is the amount of space you need to build those solar arrays. But wouldn't it just, can't you just put it on a house? Uh, yeah, you can put it, I mean, like everybody have their own solar yeah. power. The problem with solar energy, though, too, and anything like that is where you store the energy. The batteries we have now, the technology isn't quite to the point where we have efficient, safe storage. You see about some of the stuff that blows up now with batteries. So that's, that'd be a concern uh, if you had a, bunch, a battery bank in your house that you were storing your energy for. So while the solar collecting part is pretty well figured out technology, it's the storage of the energy. Any other questions, folks? All right. So you all have a nice afternoon. I will see you online Wednesday. I'm talking to Tsunami. They come run the high ground.